Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Welcome to Sketchbook Sunday. And today we're gonna paint these colorful bottles using some very inexpensive watercolor. I'm using the set of 24 watercolors from Royal and Langnickel, and they are like between 12 and 15 bucks for a set of 24 on Amazon. Really, really inexpensive. And you can probably find them in any big box store as well. So definitely something that most people have access to. We're gonna start off by sketching here on our watercolor paper. And I actually decided to draw with a pencil, just an HB pencil, plain and simple, right on my watercolor paper. Cause I was feeling really confident about these, uh, about these bottles. Plus I'm like, hey, I'm using really inexpensive watercolors. I really don't need to worry about a thing here. I'm just sketching on trying to keep my shapes fairly symmetrical. Now I did use a reference photo. However, I kind of picked and choose different bottles from the photo and rearranged them. So they would um, be kind of how I wanted them. Cause it was a really busy reference photo. And I'll try to remember to link that down below just so you can kind of see what I what I started from and what I ended up with. And um, I really like the simplicity rather than trying to cram everything in the reference photo in there. If you would like some help drawing or painting, if you feel like you just need a little more information than what my YouTube videos provide, I do have classes at lindsaywyrick.teachable.com. And now until Valentine's Day, I have 40% off any class using the coupon code 40love. So I'll link that down below if you wanna check it out. And I will be offering a class on painting glass coming up in a couple of months. So if you have any questions on painting glass you'd like me to address in the course, please let me know that in the comments below. I'm still sketching in here trying to get all of my shapes in just the way that I want them and um, kind of overlapping and sometimes I'll turn my paper around and look at it upside down if I'm worried that something's not symmetrical. But for the most part, I'm just really having fun drawing here. And I think that, you know, when you're working in a sketchbook, I mean, I'm working on a loose sheet of paper here, but when you work in a sketchbook, you really should feel free and you shouldn't be afraid of making a mistake or going right on that good paper and drawing. Now, one tip that I have, especially in the winter when we tend to use hand lotion on our hands, is to use just a big soft brush to brush away any eraser crumbs. That way you don't have to worry about like getting oils or lotion from your hands onto your watercolor paper. Because what can happen when you go and paint later is that your paint can actually resist where any of those lotions have touched your paper. So um, there's just a little tip for you there. Any soft big brush is going to work fine for that. And you know, you can still paint with it after, so it's not going to hurt the brush at all. So we're going to start off by doing a controlled wash. And a controlled wash is when we work on dry paper and we go along one edge and we create this bead of watercolor. And then we just keep bringing that bead down across the object and look Look, we end up with a super um, uniform flat wash and you can achieve this with even inexpensive paints like I am doing here. So please give it a try with whatever paints you have on hand. Now the one thing I'm going to um, advise you with doing a controlled wash is to make sure you have plenty of that color ready to go. So like I squirted some out of the tube but then I also added plenty of water to that so I didn't have to stop and add water to my paint and mix up another puddle of it. You don't wanna stop when you're doing a controlled wash or you will get streaks and back runs. That's how controlled washes um, work so well. It's by having enough paint to start off with. And then when you get to the end, you want to soak up any puddles that you have. Now looking at that green bottle, I can see my drawing wasn't perfect, but um, when we're all done, you're not even gonna notice that one of the shoulders is a little droopy on that green bottle. And honestly, sometimes your glass bottles and jars aren't exactly perfectly symmetrical. When I'm looking at how I want to approach my controlled wash, I try to go on the flattest edge that I can find. So on the two bottles that we did, I went from the side, but on this cup that's got the, the skinny stem, I started at the top and worked down. That way I wasn't going to have to try to go around those bumpy areas and then end up landlocked where I wouldn't be able to, you know, I'd have that stem done and not be able to get to the rest of the cup or I'd have to pick or choose what side I wanted to finish up and I would have ended up with a streak. So keep that in mind where you're when you're choosing where to begin your controlled wash. Also, glass is transparent. So see how I layered over that blue, layered that blue over the orange? Because that's how you would see it if you had these transparent bottles like sitting on your table or windowsill. You would see through the bottles in front to the bottles in back. Now I'm going back to the other end of the, of the table there and um, I am doing the next bottle next to my first one and that first bottle is completely dry and so is the green one. That's really important. You want to make sure if you're going to overlap that the um, adjacent 
object that you're overlapping is dry. Now, honestly, if I had thought ahead, I should have done that purple bottle first. I actually should have done that bottle and the um, that one I'm doing last. Those should have been the first two I did because those are in behind. So it would make sense to have my objects that are in front painted on top of those. But since it's transparent watercolor, it's not going to be a big problem in the final um, in the final picture, but that's definitely something that if I had to do it again, I would do the glass in back first, and then I would have done the glass in front just to help it push it visually back. And also I noticed that that yellow paint lifted up the orange a little bit so you can kind of see a little fuzzy edge on that orange glass. And when I flip this upside down, can't you you can really see where I have some of my things aren't perfectly symmetrical, but I'm not going to worry about that. This is for fun and um, I think that it's a wonderful uh, wonderful practice piece. So now I'm going over with some glazes and a glaze is simply a transparent veil of color over another veil of color. So you're going use glazes a lot when you're painting glass and um, now you can see because I have painted that over it's popped in front of the purple vase again so we're good to go. Phew, it was a little tense there for a second. Something you may find very helpful when you're using less expensive watercolors is to use them fresh from the tube. Now I typically let my watercolors dry out and then use them dry from the pans, but I find if I'm using um, a lot of color and I need to make big washes, it's much more convenient to use these colors for, straight from the tube. And it being a student grade color where there may not be as much pigment in it, it also just really helps because sometimes when you let the student colors dry down, they will flake and crack in your palette. Although I haven't had that issue with these paints in particular, it's definitely a possibility with kind of your budget grade paints. Now what I did here was I'm just again doing glazing, but this time I'm trying to capture some of the thick areas on the edge of the bottle and also get some of the refractions in the glass, which can be made by light hitting it, it can be made by shadows being cast on it, it can be made by, made by thick and thin, thin spots in the bottle causing your shadows and light to reflect and refract. You can also add adjacent colors into your bottle, like I added a little bit of yellow in there, which could be, uh, it could be light, it could also be bouncing off of that vase and behind and I put some texture on there to indicate maybe some pressed printing in the glass. Now yellow can be a little difficult to glaze because yellow does tend to be a little bit more of an opaque color so I added in some um, reds and like yellow ochres in there, browns, something like that to warm it up just to give it a little bit of um, of depth and like your, your burnt sienna or your burnt umber that could actually be a little more transparent so if you add that to your to like an orange that could give you a a really nice shadow color. Notice that I put the darker colors, especially in this squared off cobalt blue bottle here, I put those on the bottom and the edge where you have like a, a corner coming together that's going to be your thickest, darkest area because you're looking through a couple layers of glass and that's really going to be, um, it's almost going to border it, outline it, and anytime you have that you're going to have a darker area. And feel free to, you know, mix colors to get exactly what you want. I don't no, I think I do have a little bit of black on that palette. Now I have to apologize. I painted this a couple of weeks ago, but I saved it because I wanted to use it for a sketchbook Sunday. Um, and yeah, don't be afraid to, to use your black with the student colors because sometimes you just need that extra bit of punch. But I really can't complain for, you know, man, $12 paints, you really cannot complain for that. Um, again, I'm using orange. Um, you can add a little burnt sienna to that to deepen it without making it chalky. Sometimes black can go a little chalky. I didn't notice that here, especially with the blue, but I think it would kind of muddy up like the orange. But if you mix that with a brown, that will give you a, that will give you a nice dark. And sometimes just using the color with less water will give you enough of a contrast to give you that glassy look. I added some yellows in there because there's that yellow vase behind it that could be casting some light through it, but also it can represent some of the light that is just naturally present from its surroundings. Um, again, because this is a squared off vase here or bottle here, I am adding in the darkest areas on the edges and on the corners to help shape it and form it. See, once you start adding the reflections and the refractions, a lot of those a little... Um, Eh, not so symmetrical edges that you might have drawn can be kind of smushed into place or you can kind of trick the eye enough to um, put those uh, put those shapes and edges back where they where they need to be and that's fine I mean it's it's not perfect but once you kind of balance things out and you add in your colors and you add in your your shadows sorry about my head in the way there um, 
you can definitely balance it out so it looks like it belongs. Now, one thing I love about painting glass is when light goes through it, it will send colors like across the surface of like a windowsill or a table or any place where there's light. So I really wanted to get that kind of cascading soft rainbow effect in the background. I think it helps make the color stand out. And um, I just think it's it's kind of pretty. Um, so I did that. I just, I just like that effect. And then you can also play with colors like within the vase where that that yellow vase was just kind of smooth and a little boring having a little bit of that green kind of get trapped in there from the bottle next door i thought really looked pretty and um gave it a little bit more character this was really a lot of fun to paint and i didn't know what to expect with these paints when i squirted them out and started to play with them but they were fun and it's nice to know that somebody on a budget, a kid, a teenager, uh, somebody that's just getting in starting watercolors for the first time and not sure if they're really going to like it can get a less expensive paint and give it a try before they spend big bucks on artist grade paint. The other thing I recommend is that if you're using a student set like this, you're going to notice that there are certain colors you're going to burn through. And then when you burn through a color, say it's, um, say it's permanent rose, you know you use that color a lot. So you know if you invest in an artist grade color or even a higher end student grade color, you're gonna use it. It's not just gonna sit in your paint box and go to waste. It's a color you're actually gonna use up because watercolor is very slow wearing, especially professional colors. So if you're buying a ton of professional colors that you don't even know if you like or will use, that's wasted money sitting there in a paint box. If you buy like a tube of yellow ochre and cad yellow and permanent rose, colors that you already know you like because you've you know used them up on, a, on like a budget brand, you're gonna be building a professional kit that is perfect for how you paint and um and you're not going to waste any money on colors that you're not going to use now i'm not going to say these paints are as good as um, a professional grade they're absolutely not they are designed for beginners they're designed for budget conscious painters uh, and hobbyists but there's there's no reason you can't learn on this i would strongly recommend using it straight from the tube now if i want wasn't done this painting and i needed to take a break for a couple hours and it dried out and the paint dried out my palette i wouldn't scrape it out and start over i'd just give it a spritz of water and keep on going in my merry way and that's going to be fine but i wouldn't fill each well all the way to the brim and let it dry out like i would with a professional paint just because um, it is going to be a little more difficult to reactivate. Uh, I think with, you know, your budget student paints that are in tubes, you're better off just to kind of take out what you need. And like, you don't even need to clean this palette. Just next time you go to paint, you add another little dab of that color in the palette. As long as you can remember what it is, if you're not sure you'll be able to tell what color you use, then you might want to rinse it out, clean it out. Now what I'm doing is going in with a white gel pen, and this is the Uniball Signo Broad gel pen. It's my favorite gel pen. I just find that it doesn't clog, lasts long, and I get a nice broad line with it. So I really like it. I also, and it doesn't tend to leach the color up through, which is nice. Um, I also like Posca pens. The Posca pens take a little bit longer to dry. They can be a little bit more expensive, but I've refilled my Posca pens with thin down, um, like block out white acrylic paint. So it's completely up to you, whatever you choose, but you could even use a skinny brush and some white acrylic paint or some white gouache if you wanted to. And where I'm gonna show you a gouache technique in a second. But I wanted to get those really bright, shiny, shiny highlights on there because I think that's something that really makes glass look like glass in watercolor. Now, alternately, if you wanted to, you could have pre, like if you had a really um, accurate drawing and you knew exactly what you're going to do, you could go in with masking fluid before you began painting and masked out all of those little areas. I have a tough time getting really fine lines with my masking fluid. And to be honest, I find masking fluid kind of more trouble than it's worth. So I tend to, uh, I tend to, I used to use it a lot more because I was so like, Ooh, it can't be anything on my paint, but pure watercolor. I got to be a pure watercolorist. And I'm like, you know what? Lighten up lady. Have fun. Do your, do you make the work, you know, what you want you know, do, do what you feel like doing. Um, so now I'm using some white gouache here and I'm just going, actually, I think this is the white watercolor from that set even. And I'm just going in and adding those highlights that are broader, they're wider, but they're not as, um, as strong, they're not as opaque. So these would be like the highlights that come from like light bouncing off of a surface and, and bouncing back onto the bottle. It's not your direct shiny, shiny highlight. It's your reflected highlights. So if there was a white tablecloth and you had that bottle sitting there, light's going to bounce off the tablecloth and then hit the bottle indirectly. And that's what you're doing with the gouache because the gouache where it's actually just white watercolor from that set, it's not going to be as strong as that white opaque 
opaque gel pen and it's going to give you a softer um, indirect highlight which I think is so pretty and it looks really natural and it really starts to flesh these bottles out and make them feel solid on the picture. I'm so pleased with how this came out. I hope you give something like it a try. Like I said, I will link the reference photo that I went by to get these bottles from. Don't get overwhelmed by all the bottles in that picture though. And if you have some pretty bottles at home, set them on your windowsill and sketch them and paint them. That's really going to be the best for you because then you can actually get close, look at it, look at where your light's coming from, maybe turn your light or, and put light on it and make it work for you. So, um, have fun painting glass. If you're interested in my glass class, that's coming up in a couple months. If you have any questions for that, you can go ahead and put them in the comments down below. And if you want to take advantage of my 40% off any class through Valentine's Day, I'll have info for that down below as well in the video description. Thanks for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.